All right, let's see everyone today. If you did not get a copy of the lesson that we're currently on, it was on the stand as you walked in the door. We're continuing our study of building our spiritual foundations in this current lesson we're in. It's lesson number two. We're talking about the beginning of sin. Let me get to about one. There we go. We're looking at the beginning of man and sin. Okay. Things are a little sluggish today for some reason. So let's do this instead. Where I'd like to begin after we we'll start here in just a moment with a word of prayer. We're going to pick up still looking at the devil, specifically under section number A. The serpent tempting Adam and Eve. There's a few more things to kind of talk about within that, and then we'll go forward with our lesson. But before we begin this morning, let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. And um, I'm going to ask um, Dylan. Did you mind leading us a word of prayer? Thank you, sir. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so in the beginning of this particular lesson, we're, we are focusing on how the creation of man and the introduction of sin into the world. And last week, we looked at the general facts regarding the beginning of mankind, how that God created man and woman, God prepared a garden for Adam. We looked at how that God gave Adam specific instructions regarding the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We talked about then how God made the woman for man. And then ultimately the point is, is that God gave Adam and Eve everything that they could possibly need. Point that we made last week in the sermon, and kind of this, because we looked a little bit at this point. Um, one of the major causes of sin, I think, in a, kind of a general way of looking at it, is lack of contentment or discontent. Okay, um, James tells us that a man is drawn away, he sins when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, and then when that enticement gives birth to an action, it gives birth to sin, and sin therefore brings death. And so oftentimes we are tempted by something that, we, that, that, that uh, feeds upon, if you would, um, a lack of contentment, okay? A very basic example, you're hungry, and you pass, let's say, a food stand, and the food is there, no one is watching. The greater the hunger, the greater the temptation to do what? Still, take the food, okay? Um, but if you're not hungry, is there a temptation to take the food? In general, there's not, okay? Now, I realize there are other motivating factors to sin, okay, and I understand that, but when we Jump forward now to what we were looking at last week in regards to the Garden of Eden and the introduction of sin, or I should say really the temptation and then the follow through with the sin. When he appealed, made the appeal, that is he, the serpent, made the appeal to Eve, there were three things observed by Eve regarding the food. One, it looked good. Two, uh, desire to make one wise. And three, um, you could eat it. All right. It tastes good. And those temptations, the way that she was tempted, would have been thwarted had she been fully content with what God had given them. Every tree in the midst of the garden they could eat from. Even the tree of life they could eat from. But of this one tree, God said don't eat, and it's this one tree that Satan, in the process of deceiving her, painted a picture beautiful enough for her to heed and to listen and to think, you know what? There's one thing God hasn't given me. Now, bear in mind, I'm speculating her thoughts at this point. But there's one thing God hasn't given me, and that's knowledge of good and evil. Wouldn't it be great to have that also? Because that's kind of the way he made the appeal to her. All right, go ahead, John. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that they should have done and we should do, we should practice a lot more, 
than we do, I think, is to count our blessings. <coughs> we need to do that often. Because if you're thinking about your blessings, you can't be discontented. You okay. can't, you know, those two don't go together. So if we would spend more time thinking about the things that God has given us and how blessed we are, I don't think we would be covetous at all. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. <clears throat> Contentment with godliness is great, what Paul says. Yeah. Great game. Yeah. And that can only be truly there. And, and I think it's a good point. The more we remind ourselves of all that God has done to us, the less discontentment um, we'll be tempted with. That's a good point. Any other thoughts? Dan? I think like uh, early on, the children of Israel, God's people, saw the nations around them, uh, the affluence of the nations around them and what they had. So they they wanted kings. And at the time when they didn't have kings, they, uh, they wanted kings. And I think uh, that happens to us today, we we see the uh, success of uh, people living in sin, and it makes us want to cut corners and, and not be obedient to God's word. Uh, we don't count spiritual uh, being spiritually accepted by God as. As something to be desired. We, we, sometimes we think of uh, this world's riches mm -hmm. over uh, being spiritual. That's right. That's right. Any other thoughts about that? All right. A couple points here real quick before we go on any further. And I, I was looking back. We may have already covered a little bit of this, just kind of, but kind of a re-emphasis here. Um, one of the points we talked about had to do with the fact that this could be the early form of idolatry. Okay. Early form of idolatry. You look forward to um, Abraham's relatives, Laban. He had possession of house, household idols. That would put us around 2000 BC approximately. Um, you jump forward to Colossians 3, 5, Philippians 3. We did look at this. Covetousness in and of itself is idolatry. And so this very well could be considered kind of the first forms of idolatry. Okay, and it causes us then to stop and consider our own life. And going back to what everybody has just said there, um, Dan and um, John, we need to make certain that we are content and that we do not find ourselves coveting after something else. We only have one God. He's the only one who we worship. And while we may not have physical idols within our life today, that is physical statues, wood statues, and stone statues, there are things that are worshipped frequently by people and we need to make certain that we don't allow ourselves to walk in that same mindset um one more miss mary mm -hmm. um, when i was looking at uh, the commandments um the first commandment in uh, exodus 20 is do not have other gods besides me mm -hmm. and and jesus said the first commandment was to love the lord thy god um, with all your heart, all your soul, and you know, on and on. And I realized that those were saying the same thing. And and I'm wondering too about that passage in the New Testament about you know he said I uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Is the whole list not idolatry? Or am I wrong for assuming? Oh. I can say covetousness is idolatry, but maybe the whole list in that passage was idolatry because it was putting other things and desires before our God. Sure. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. We could talk about um, emotional desires, even to the point of anger. Go, go to the two, two different spectrums. Whatever dominates our life and prevents us, keeps us, hinders us from serving God is something that we've now put in front of God, even our own selfishness. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so then the next point we covered, or we were getting into, I think we looked at some of this. Let's talk about the serpent for just a moment. Um, so we look at the story that we read through there in Genesis chapter 3. Um, who's the agent behind the serpent, if you would? 
It's going to be Satan. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we talked about this a little bit. It's not the first time. It's not the only time in the Bible we see um, an animal speaking or someone, an agent speaking through an animal. Think about Balaam and his donkey. Jumping forward to the New Testament, even the, the, the demons um, would um, speak through the person that they were in type thing there. But a couple of points there with it. We talked about the fact that the devil is a murderer and a liar. Jesus makes this point, John 8, 44. Murderer in that, who did he murder in a matter of speaking? Adam and Eve, spiritual death, separation from God. Yes, they made the decision. But who rendered the blow of temptation upon them? He did. Okay, he did that. Um, the devil sinned from the beginning. 1 John 3, 8, John makes the point. Um, 1 Timothy 3, 6, he's also prideful. Kind of see that in relationship to the qualifications of elders. Not to be prideful as the devil was. And then lastly, the devil is the serpent of old who deceives the whole world. Where did we see that picture come in at or that clarity? In our study through Revelation. Notice with me here if you would for just a second. Let's see if I can get this working properly. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look first at verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Notice here, if you would, with me in the text here. And I, I realize that we're looking at a vision. Understand that. There is a particular point to this, but I think this is extremely significant to understand who it is that we are dealing with. In the imagery here painted, he says the great dragon was cast out. He says specifically the serpent of old called what? The called the devil. That's exactly right. Called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This pretty much sums up the whole of the work of the devil from the beginning all the way to his defeat by Christ in the gospel. Okay, This is a picture of the one who tried and successfully did lead Adam and Eve away from God and has continued to deceive the whole world. We also see saw that statement again, this point over in chapter 20. Note with me there in verses 2 and 3. He says, He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years. Verse 3, And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations. How much longer? No more till the thousand years were finished. And then he says, after these things, he says he must be released. And he goes on for a little while. Ultimately, we see a defeat for, or not for, we see him being defeated. His sin against God, sin against man, is his deceiving mankind. And man followed him. All right, any thoughts or questions or comments? Okay. A uh, couple more points real quick. Uh, did, uh, did the devil, I kind of already touched on this, but I do want to cover this a little bit. Did the devil stop with Adam and Eve? Okay, that's right. It's not like you start a ball rolling down the hill and you just step back and watch the devastation as it goes down the hill. All right, we know that he continues to tempt. Look in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. The Apostle Paul there, in talking about our need to stand, he tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against what? The devil. Yeah, the wiles or the schemes, depending on your translation of the devil. And kind of the same idea, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he writes in the context there, he uses a statement, for we are not ignorant of his what? Of his devices. Okay. So fundamentally, what happened in the beginning continues to happen to this day but throughout the whole course of this time period has man ever been able to hmm, I don't ask that question just yet I'll come back to that question here in just a moment uh, let's see let's come back to our text well the reason why I, I had tried I was trying to be careful when putting this lesson together we are looking at building blocks of our spiritual foundation okay if you look at the graphic on the front of your lesson, we will eventually get to the understanding of what Jesus Christ did. Okay. Normally in a sermon, you would include you know, all 5,000 verses and go an hour and a half and, and cover everything from beginning to the end. But what we're trying to do is build an understanding of this. And so right now, this lesson is focusing on how sin entered the world. Now, 
Come back to the text, Genesis chapter 3, there in verse 7. Let's go back there for just a moment. And let me get my charts brought back up for a second. <clears throat> there we go. Right here. Okay. So after Adam and Eve engaged in their sin, they sinned against God, what did they do? Yeah, they hid from God. So let's look at this here, beginning in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the, from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave, with, gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, who, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. All right, so we'll pause there for just a moment. All right, during the course of this, many times people want to focus on, let me do one thing here real quick. <clears throat> For some reason, my remote control's not working. And I mean the digital computer remote control where people at home can say, oh, there's full John, there's half John, there's scriptures. You know, full John, half John, it's not working. Um, so many times we want to focus on what he says here in the text in his question to them, okay? He says, who told you that you were naked? But let's back up for just a moment before we focus on this. What happened to them in verse 7? When they ate of this fruit, he says, what was opened? Yeah, he says, their eyes were open. Now, what does that term generally mean? Is it a very literal sense? Does this mean they were blind up to this point? Now, what is the idea? And even we will use it today. His eyes were opened. Awareness, Awareness. yeah. You, you realize something. You learn something. You know, I didn't realize that, that David's such a scoundrel until I had, I had my eyes opened, you know. <laughs> Then I knew David was a scout. He's not, you know. I'm still blind to that. <laughs> Just ask her. <laughs> I ain't going there at all. <laughs> so the idea of this figure of speech here is to show simply that they were aware. And now he says, and they knew that they were naked. This, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, there's not much covering on this subject. But, sorry. Um, Okay. All right. Any thoughts or comments about that? 
Okay. Um, let's kind of go from that um, back to this. Adam and Eve were in that harmony with God. Okay. And as Dave points out, there was nothing to fear. But at this moment, what do you think? And we've, we mentioned this last week. There were several firsts that Adam and Eve encountered. What would have been the first at this point? Shame. Okay. When you look at the references of the Old Testament, um, there are many times that you'll see the idea of nakedness to represent shame. Okay. And in this case of point here, and I will say th this is going to be my, I'm going to use the term opinion. I use it very carefully on it. Um, and I'll kind of explain why here in a second. In my opinion of this, this their, this is the only way they could hide their shame, okay? Because they knew the point of them realizing that they were naked and then their reaction of sewing fig leaves together, they were trying to hide their nakedness. The problem is they could not hide what they had done. The shame was now present. Regret will also be another first that they realize um, once they're cast forth from the garden there. Now, this is why when the Lord, the Lord comes on, he's walking through the garden in the cool of the day, something unusual has now happened. Adam, Adam and Eve were doing what? Hiding from God. Okay? And so, of course, he knows what's happened. He knows everything that has taken place up to this point there and what would happen, of course. But anyway, so he says, why are you hiding? You know, where are you? And they said, well, we're hiding from you because we were naked. They were unclothed. Now, this had not been a problem had it up until this point. I've, I've, I've heard this passage used um, before in times past that, well, nakedness in and of itself is wrong. The problem is, and yes, <laughs> proper context, keep all that in mind and everything. But who was present in the garden based on the, 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 the biblical account? Adam and his wife, that's exactly right. Now, why would being naked be wrong but right when they had no knowledge of it being wrong, and then all of a sudden, now they realize it's wrong, now be wrong. In other words, are we accountable to the law of God, even if we don't have the knowledge of it? It's effectively what we see within the scriptures there. Now, in this case in point, I think the simple thing was their shame. It was their shame, they were trying to hide their shame, and the Lord asks them in this conversation, notice what he says, who's told you this, and more importantly, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? That's the problem right there. Now, again, did the Lord know they ate of it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This is now the admission of their guilt, okay? Owning up to what they had done. Then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. All right, now we have kind of, uh, what do they call this whenever you try to blame someone else there? Yeah. Under the bus. Mary, don't point at Dylan when you do that. <laughs> That's right, throw him under the bus, yeah. So Adam didn't take responsibility. I mean, he did, but he blamed Eve first. And that is the course of the events as they transpired. Actually, he blamed God first. The woman you gave me? That's a good point. The woman you gave me did yeah. this. That's right. And so he then says to her, what is this you've done? And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, this is a true account of everything that took place. But in the course of this, we see this result of sin within their life. And so the next section here, we'll talk about just briefly, the Lord will begin to lay the curses upon them. But any thoughts or comments before we do that? Blake. Just, this whole interaction that, that transpires, it, it reminds me of like being a, process of being a parent and you know like you you give your children specific instructions you're like you're gonna you're, you can go play in the room but like be careful because you don't want to mess with this thing because it's fragile and you could mess it up and then you know, like you walk in the room a little bit later and the kids are nowhere to be found but your thing's broken and so when you go confront them they're in their room and they're like i don't know what happened um and like, i don't, I don't want to trivialize the the events here but it's but you know like you as a parent obviously know that they disobeyed you and and that's what we see with god like like you know he asked them the questions but he already knew the answers to the questions right uh, and, it, and you know it's like from the very beginning we we understand that god sees everything and god knows everything that's a good point john i'm wondering if 
wondering if he, he uh, gives him the chance to kind of own this. And okay. Ask for forgiveness. And maybe he's wanting to see about their character or something. Uh, they don't do a good job right. uh, when they have the chance. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe some of their curses wouldn't have been quite so severe if they had taken a different approach. I don't know. That's definitely specula speculative. Yeah. Um, the whole learning process would have been better on them, but that's a good, good interesting question, though. Richard. I was just going to uh, remark on his first question to them is, who told you that you were naked? Yeah. And I'm wondering if that implies anything about um, the circumstances or if it was simply a matter of the only way you could know is if someone told you or you did this. Yeah. So... Combination of both, yeah. Well, there wasn't anyone around. I know. And, and, but, and, but they had to learn it from somewhere. Or, yeah, because up to this point, there was no reason for them to feel shame. There was no reason for them to even be aware that there was, that they were naked. I mean, um, yeah, good point. Mary. Just a quick parallel. I think the way God handled David and the way the question was asked to David and how David responded, you know, concurs with what uh, John is pointing out. With David himself, yeah, yes. Yeah. Because he committed adultery, yep. and and he didn't have him put her away. He wasn't killed. He didn't have the same punishment that the law decreed. Yeah. He should have had. And he did delay acknowledgement of his sin he, for at least did. nine months. I mean. Well, but when he was confronted with it, when the question yeah. came up to him, he did. He quickly embraced him yeah. or confessed him. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a good point. All right, the next section here, beginning going back to verse 14, we see the Lord now laying out the curses. So this is the first of many times this will, this will happen. When we say the word curse, in our language, we may think of um, like foul language. All right, But the idea of cursing here is basically the idea of pronouncing the punishment or the consequences of the wickedness. For, for instance... If we were to jump forward to the nation of Israel, this was this is seen greatly when you look at, I think it's like Deuteronomy 28. The Lord spends just maybe a third of the chapter there saying, okay, if you obey me, then these wonderful things are going to happen. I mean, boil it down in a nutshell. But if you disobey me, and this is the rest of the chapter, on into the next chapter and two, these are the cursings that's going to happen to you. And that even foretold their captivity. Okay, them going off into captivity, and then the Lord, memory serves, then returning, bringing them back as far as within that uh, prophecy or set of cursings there. So when individuals walk contrary to God, are there blessings or are there cursings that fall within their life? Ultimately, cursing. Okay. Now, I'm not trying to say that there are bad things that will happen when people sin against God. There are consequences, and we do see that, but we saw the overall aspect. Adam and Eve, they were cast forth from the garden. Spiritual death entered the world when Adam and Eve sinned. And so here's what he says in the cursings here. He says, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every, he's talking to the serpent, I should clarify, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now this is a challenging portion of the text there. All right, because we talked about the possibility, and I think it's a strong possibility, that the agency behind the serpent was the devil, the devil speaking through the serpent. But yet in the course of this curse, it does appear this creature was cursed by God. Okay, Now, that's what the text says. But then when you transition down into verse 15, then it makes you wonder a little bit more if he is also talking about the devil. Because look what verse 15 says. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman. That's why women hate snakes. I've heard that for years. That's why women hate snakes. I don't know. Um, but then when you read the rest of it, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
There's the clincher right there. Okay. But in the Hersey, the man's not mentioned. Yeah. There's only one uh, that ever been shared in the history of mankind that gave birth without the help of a, of a man. That's right. That's of the Holy Spirit. The, Talking about there with Mary. Yeah. The, yeah. the H is capitalized there, too. Yeah. Thanks to the translators. Yeah. It shows that, that at least with, and there are some who would disagree with this, but in the general scope of the scholars, they view this as talking about Jesus. And you shall bruise his heel. Talking about, and, and not literally bruise the heel, but when you compare two different wounds, bruising the heel or bruising the head, which one's greater? The head. Which one will stop? The head. In this case of point, Jesus' death would have been fulfilled in you shall bruise his heel. When you go back and you look at Revelation chapter 12, the first part of it, and in the vision there we see the efforts of the world to take the child that was born and then when the child was taken to heaven, then to pursue and to persecute the woman and everything. All right, there we see the efforts of Satan as far as in the vision laid out there of him trying to stop the Christ. And the only wound that Satan could render against Christ, if you would, is when he died upon the cross of Calvary. Now, we look at death as a permanent thing, don't we? Okay? But with Christ, it was simple bruising of the heel. You know. But the other side of the coin, he, talking about the descendant, the seed, the single seed, too, as David pointed out, of the woman there, he shall bruise the head of the serpent. And that is complete victory over this. And so this is the first prophecy that looks forward to the solution of the problem of sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world when they uh, gave in to Satan's temptation. All right, any thoughts? Any comments? Let's go to Nat and then Richard. Yeah, I think there's like, we have many, many examples in Scripture where like uh, a worldly example is given for a spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. And so, man and snakes have literally been eternal adversaries ever since okay. that time, right? So, right. as we're just trying to live and stuff, snakes are biting us, and we're killing snakes because of that. So, um, so it seems kind of like a temporal um, allegory that's been given for um, Satan, who is our eternal adversary, right? Mm -hmm. Up until Christ establishes his kingdom over here. Well, and if we wanted to build on that... Look at how snakes, look at how the poisonous ones, especially, but look at where their danger lies. They're not walking around. They're not out in the open trying to attack. A lot of times you are warned that if you see a poison snake, what do you do? They're venomous. They're poisonous. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. Run. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you avoid them. Okay. Many of times they don't they don't pursue to attack you, do they? They respond if they feel threatened. Um, and so now that that's where the analogy ends. They they respond when they feel threatened. But the point is they are subtle, they are hiding, and many times you will come upon them before you even realize it and then get bit. And only someone who's been connected with the Boy Scouts for a long time would correct me and say they're venomous. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> See, descendant of Eve for sure. Um, Richard. Uh, this is first was going to ask about uh, if there might be any significance to the way that the end of uh, the verse 15 ends uh, after the semicolon. Mm -hmm. I would normally think that you would render that as you shall bruise his heel and he shall bruise your head, putting the events in the order that they would occur. Is it? Wondering, uh, is, would there be any significance to that? And the I, other thing is, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. with snakes, that the majority of people bit them are because they decided to play with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the only thing I can think of, if there's an intent behind this order, and I don't, I wouldn't question whether or not there was. I would, I would assume so, since it's all by inspiration. It goes to the victor first. He shall bruise your head. And the only thing you'll do to him is bruise his heel. Okay. You know, roughly. Yeah. David? And then, uh, Dan? If you throw a stick out for a snake, he won't go get it and bring it back to you. 
Wouldn't that be handy? <laughs> you can't tame a snake. Yeah. I mean, they're never friendly to you. Uh, and they, I knew a man that stepped off his front porch. He had a, he run a lake, a mountain lake, mm -hmm. south of here. He stepped off his front porch and a copperhead bit him on the leg. He lost his leg because, of, you know, he, he wasn't trying to uh, do anything to that snake. The snake was lying in wait. And that's just like the devil. You know, uh, you have to look behind every bush. <laughs> the devil's going to be there. And the devil has got smarter. Now he disguises himself more so than he did then. Okay. He, he, he might appear to be uh, something advantageous to you. He doesn't come to you as a snake, or we'd all be able to shun the devil, you know. Yeah. Paul even refers to that, those who are false teachers who present themselves to be false apostles. We're not surprised because even right. the servants or the angels, or can't remember the wording exactly, present themselves as ministers of light. Right. Yeah. Um, who was the other hand? I saw go up. Richard. I was just going to remark on, you know, I said that the majority of the people bitten is people that decide they're going to play with them. Mm -hmm. And what I was intending to mean by that is that there are too many people who think I'm going, they flirt with sin in, mm -hmm. in the sense that they think I can get close and not cross this line. Yes. Um, and then they end up in trouble. I think that's a good, good way of looking at that. Yeah. See how close we can get. Right. Yeah. All right. So a few more points here real quick. He now curses the woman. So in this case of point, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So the consequence for Eve's sin, and, and this way we need to look at this, although it is from her this point forward, since she's the mother of all living, you know, if you kind of think about this for a minute. Her consequence had to do with the process of childbearing, okay? And so he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. Pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Why? Don't say because God said so. Why do you think I should say? Because this is part of the curse, okay? Remember, she was made as a companion for him, a helpmeet suitable for him. But now he says, because of this, what happened to Eve? Remember what Paul says? It was not Adam who was deceived, but Eve was the one that was deceived. And so I don't know if that is a direct correlation. The Bible never really paints that picture. But the result of her sin is that her desire would be for her husband, and he shall rule over you. Um, Paul says she was deceived, but Adam was not the one that was deceived. Uh, let's see. And then lastly... Then, Adam, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, he said, Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil ye shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, I asked the next question kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit, but whose curse was the worse by the way we might judge it? I would think, speaking very carnally, I'm going to get in trouble with all you mothers. <laughs> I would think it was Adam for one reason. Eve would have pain in childbearing, and her desire would be for her husband. And that's not a bad thing, okay? The husband takes care of her. The husband provides for her. It's not a bad life, okay? But it's the position that the Lord has now put her in because of her sin. And once she stopped having children, do you can, oh, don't ask that question. Um, once you stop having children, you no longer have birth pains and stuff like that, okay? But with Adam, at what point would his, the consequence of his curse cease? death all the days of his life he would have to, so even after he was done having kids okay she could sit on the proverbial front porch in the rocking chair and watch adam labor in the field not saying it was that way but yeah 
I think I have a few who might disagree with that. But let's go to Richard. I was just going to ask on uh, verse 16. Uh -huh. uh, in the ESV, the last part of the verse says, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And it does put a note there that says, Or shall be toward. Um, so uh, I wondered why they chose the, the rendering it's going to have to do with the Hebrew word translated here. Either there's a challenge in trying to understand properly what the word means, the context, or how it's worded in the Hebrew, could also be the Hebrew manuscript. Now, there's, for instance, there's one Hebrew manuscript, the latest one around 1000 AD, where the majority of our translations come from. But the ESV differs a little bit, and I can't remember the details of it, but when you compare it to the Septuagint, and I haven't done that, sometimes the Septuagint will render a little bit differently. The Septuagint was translated off an older manuscript about a thousand years earlier, effectively. And so there may, it may have something to do with that. Uh, but like this one has footnote literally toward as well. Um, so I'd have to look up to see why the ESV. I just wondered if that presaged the idea that husband and wife will not always uh, get along. So. <laughs> <laughs> One's always what? blaming the other one. Um, <laughs> The New American Standard Bible renders it, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Just something in the text the translators of the ESV saw and thought it was significant. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts? Well, I look at that and see it as it, that's establishing the man as the head of the household. It does. Yeah, yeah. Even going back to before this point, that's not very clear. She's made from his rib from his side he she was a helpmate suitable for him but now because of this he clearly states your desire shall be for your husband he shall rule over you yeah well if you look at the, the punishment that was given to adam it sets up that the ultimate responsibility for the household is adam exactly so yeah. even though it was eve that that committed the, the sin in the first place for the family, it's Adam's ultimate responsibility. So that's why he was given out what we would think is a, a greater punishment. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I asked, I asked that question poorly well ago. I should have talked about duration, and we've already dealt with this. Adam's role never ends in providing for his family. We talked about that ends at death. Um, okay, I know there's a lot more we could talk about that. But that's the last bell, thankfully. Um, <laughs> real quick, um, the I, I do want to talk a little bit more next week about them being driven from the garden. And so we'll discuss that. But then once we talk about that, let's continue in our outline. We're going to look at how sin abounded in the world. And this is significant to understanding what brought Christ to die upon the cross of Calvary. And so we'll pick up here with verse 20, Genesis 3. Um, next Lord's Day morning. Appreciate all your participation and comments.